So everybody, this is Mike from A to Zen. I am here with Mr. Catesby Jones. Hello, hello. We did a songwriter showcase last night with he and Tony Ellis. That was quite a treat. And um, I just want to sit down and get to know you a little bit better. I mean, I've, I've admired you from up close and afar, and <laughs> I've had a chance to do that as well. I look better from afar. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. We, you were doing some storytelling last night. You have written how many songs in your life? I, I know you probably just can estimate. No, I, I actually am about to add it up because I'm doing a 50-year retrospective, and I think we're a little bit north of 1,000 songs. Thousands, But I wow. started writing in 1973, and I've been very prolific. I, um, you know, I work really hard on a song, and when it's done, I'm done with it, and I move on to another one. I'm always going for the next song, and I try to finish a song. Even if it's not a great song, I try to get it done so that I can get it out of the way because I often feel like one song leads to another, as if you're drawing water from a well, and maybe the first bucket's muddy, but the second buddy's bucket's going to be clear. They're similar songs, but one's not as good as the other, so I just keep moving forward as much as I can. So as a fellow songwriter, I write... A lot of songs, many of which I'm not astute enough to actually grab a napkin and write them down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you access all thousands, thousand songs? Oh, yeah. I have everything on, on CD, uh, on, on in, a, in a computer, and a lyric for every single song. I've been pretty diligent about, you know, keeping a record. Really? Yeah, it used to be cassettes, and then I changed everything over to CDs, and now everything's changed over to, you know, a data data and a computer. So actually recording the song yes. though is the yes. way you actually keep it cuz I have yeah. I have songs I've written, you know, I don't know, 5 6 years ago. Pretty good songs. I couldn't even remember they them. They right do now. slip away. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've got um some up I would say 75% of it is just guitar vocals. And then there's everything I've done on albums and stuff. It's got drums and bass and singing and stuff. But but I can actually remind myself how it goes and whenever i get in a dry spell of writing i'll just pull out my books and i'll just go from a to z a to z <laughs> all the way through it and and practice the songs and remember the nuances and familiarize myself with them um, so probably i can sing at least 90 percent of them off the top of my head and the rest i need a lyric sheet just to prompt me and remind me how it goes and there's some of them i don't sing anymore but that, doing the math, that's 900 songs. Am I doing that right, John? I 900 so. songs off the top of your head? Probably, yeah. Now, <sighs> I hurt my hand really seriously <laughs> in 90, 1997. Uh, we were redoing our a bungalow in Wilmington, and I ran my hand through a table saw. And so a lot of the jazzier songs that I wrote back in, in, in my youth and in, in Nashville, I physically can't play them anymore because my finger doesn't bend. I just now saw that. I've yeah, seen my finger play. doesn't bend, and this finger got really compromised. So I've had to reinvent the way I play. So I tend to, to perform more of the songs that I've written since 1997, or actually it took me about two years to want to play again, since about 2000. Since about 2000 on, those are the songs that I mostly play. But I can pull back into the past, um, you know, a couple hundred of them. Yeah, it's just, it's fun. I love it. I love writing songs. I love singing for people. So as you kind of are coming in and discovering A to Zen, and we are very stoked that you are becoming part of the community that's here and stuff. Nice. Um, from a songwriter standpoint, because there's a lot of them around here, you know, what's some wisdom that you would impart to an aspiring the songwriter? songwriter? Yeah. Wisdom. I guess at 72 and a half, I should be wise. Um, <laughs> wisdom. Uh, I guess keep moving forward. Don't get stuck on one song for a really, really long time. Um, don't be afraid to revisit a song and find its fatal flaw and rewrite. Uh, in the beginning, when I was, you know, you know just a pot-smoking hippie, you know, I felt like all my songs were from God's lips to my ears, and I would never change anything. So they sort of 
went on paper and went on tape as I first wrote them in the first hour. But after living in Nashville for seven years and co-writing with other people, you really learn how to retune and revisit and recraft your material because uh, maybe the second verse just isn't quite up to the standards of the first. And you can't get married to things. You need to always be reviewing and making sure you've gotten it just like it could be. So wisdom, don't be afraid to revisit your songs and look at them through maybe a month's distance to see if it really was what you thought it was when you wrote it. That's, that's some wisdom. No, that's interesting to me. And then you shared with us last night that, um, I forget what timetable it was, but you actually wrote a song many, many people have heard. Yes. What's it like to actually get a song published like that? Where it you... was unbelievable. Which song was it, just so we can... Travis Tritt's first cut, his his breakout t song, Country Club. I'm a member song. of the country <laughs> club. And it was really exciting. Um I'm really kind of over it now. I mean, it was 1989, and it's so long ago, and I've written, you know, 500 songs since then that I love much more. But I'm really proud to have had a top 10 country hit. No kidding, and man. It, and it really did well, and it made his career, and he took off from then and became one of the most successful performers of the 90s in country music. But it... It was magic the way it happened because my brother-in-law introduced me to my co-writer, Dennis Lord, because Dennis opened a bank account in my brother-in-law's bank. And he said, you'd really like Kate Spee. You ought to go meet him. So he came into my publishing company, and I'd only been working there for about three months. And we bantered back and forth with some songs. And then he said, hey, listen to this. And he played me the first few lines of, of Country Club's chorus. I'm a member of the Country Club. And... Well, I said, that's pretty good. Let's finish it. So I added the bona fide dance and fool and mighty good game of pool into the chorus. And then we finished his second verse and tweaked his first verse. And we played it for my publisher. And she said, that's a great song, but it's too critical of wealthy people. <laughs> you need to soften it so it's not excluding a really big record buying part of the, the country. So we changed it around instead of being... I don't do this and I don't do that, but I love to pick the blues on the back porch to a scenario of a rich woman in a limousine, you know, kind of teasing the guy in a pickup truck. And he follows her into the parking lot of the country club. And she says, well, you can't come in here because it's only members allowed. And he says, but I'm a member of the country club. Country music is what I love. And damned if the, if the demo didn't turn out great, partially because Alan Jackson sang it for $45 before he was famous. And the, wow. My, wow. My, my <laughs> song plugger, Mike Sebastian, was college friends with a guy named Greg Brown who was producing Travis Tritt's first album. Travis Tritt came out of the Warner Brothers office in Atlanta, Georgia, and no one was really too sure how it was going to go because he was kind of rocky and he had a Moloch and, and it was pretty much the traditional country era of Randy Travis at that time. So no one was really wanting to rock the, the boat. But at any rate, they played that. Mike Sebastian played it from his friend. And, and Greg said, that's fantastic. And they played it for Warner Brothers. And they played it for Travis. And they said, boom, we got ourselves a, 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 we got a coat hanger to hang this whole project on. And so they named the album Country Club. And they named the bus Country Club. And they named the tour Country Club. And... It just took off. It only went to number nine, but I, I think it got number one airplay. But back then, uh, it wasn't—I don't know—it wasn't acceptable or popular for new artists to get a number one hit. I mean, a new artist back in 1989 wasn't going to knock Randy Travis and Reba McIntyre off the top of the chart. Now it happens all the time, but back then it didn't. But anyway, the song did great. I still get royalties on it. Um, wow. I rarely play it unless it's asked for. But uh, I'm really proud of it, and I told you that it got in a Clint Eastwood movie in the soundtrack. The Mule. You yeah, in a barbecue scene there in a barbecue restaurant, and they're asking him how I, I, you have to see the movie, but he's running drugs. 
but uh, it, it's in the background. And so it's been a really good run, and I wish I had five or six more of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I got discouraged in Nashville. Um, it just seemed like songs were just getting demoed and pitched and put on hold, and then no one would record it. And it was just this endless cycle of up and down and up and down. And my parents were getting older, and our kids were growing up, and we decided it would be more fun to live by the ocean. So we moved to my parents' hometown, of Wilmington, North Carolina, and gave up on the Nashville dream. And it was a pretty big decision, and uh, I still stand by it. And my kids thank me every day for it because they all learn to surf and they love the beach. And my wife became a really uh, important person at our regional hospital where she probably would have been just a worker bee at Vanderbilt Hospital. So everybody blossomed from it, and I got that story to tell you. You know, that's huge for me, though, as we sit and talk. There's two things that come to mind. One is to go back to the Country Club song. I wonder how much that underpinned country music going forward, because... You know, obviously, Travis Tritt published a fun song kind of like that. Now you have artists like Toby Keith and all this stuff where prior to that, country song was very Patsy Cline or Randy Travis type well, stuff. It and, was. And so the introduction of the fun country song, which is very prevalent now. Yeah. I wonder how much. Nashville has these eras that it goes through. I mean, you know, you had the Farron Youngs and the Willie Nelsons back in the day, and they were pumping out songs for Patsy Cline and. Loretta, Loretta, Loretta Lynn, and, and then Chet Atkins came in and turned it into the lush Nashville sound, and, you know, Barbara Mantrell and people like that were starting to make money and Ronnie Millsap. And then the new traditionals came in with Randy Travis, and that was kind of a reaction to the, all the strings and the vocals. And then the class, of, they call it the class of 1989, and it included Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Clint Black, Vince Gill, I think Trisha Yearwood was in there and Garth Brooks. Right. Th that that wow. became the new <laughs> sound. <laughs> right. That became the new sound of Nashville. And it took, I mean, Urban Cowboy was really great for Nashville. Mickey Gilly, Johnny Lee, all that stuff. Right. With the Urban Cowboy soundtrack that Travolta did. That was Nashville's first kind of big breakout. But when the Garth Brooks era came, it turned country music into competitive with pop and rock i mean it for a while it was bigger than pop and rock it's huge i i was a young construction worker at the time wrestling with people on the job site whether we were going to listen yeah. to old leonard skinner or the new country and hank i like the new hank country Williams, <laughs> hank Williams jr and, <laughs> and those cats and uh, uh tracy lawrence i mean they, they really really made a new era now it's something new and everybody poo bahs it and said blah 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 I'm not going to sound like parents saying, oh, that Elvis Presley, you can't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's that got their time. sounds you know, so familiar. And, and country music now, it incorporates rap. It, it incorporates sampled sounds and, and different beats. And uh, you just got to embrace the future. You can't drag your feet and get anywhere in this world. I mean, you don't have to love it, but you don't have to poo by it. It's so interesting, though, to hear that perspective. I hear the perspective of being in Nashville for, yeah. you said, seven years, right? Yeah. And then coming to a decision where it's like, you know, this isn't working for me or my family. I think I'm going to go do what I do. Yeah. You know, what a cool and, thing. And if I had stayed, um, you know, at least five or six of my co-writers went on to have successful careers. But it seems like, you know, they'd... They'd, they'd have one song every two or three years, and that'll do it for you. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I just, I lost the love. I lost the love of songwriting. I completely gave in to the co-writing formula, and my heart and soul is really a, sol a solo writer. Right. I really just much prefer to write by myself, but I devoted my time to co-writing Partially because I didn't like the publishers retooling the songs. I'm going, hey, wait, that's, that's, that's something from my heart and soul. 
You can't change that. Right. You don't know what I was feeling when I wrote that. You can't change this around. So I didn't care what they did with the co-write because those were basically just title down intellectual songs. They weren't coming from my heart. They were like, well, let's let's write a song about my pickup trucks got to get up and go to get up and go before I got up and went. Hey, that's a great title. <laughs> let's write that. And, and we'd whoop it out in about two or three sessions, you know, go to lunch, pat each other on the back, make a $300 demo, move on to the next song, you know. But it didn't mean anything to me. So I didn't care how the publisher changed it. So I just co-write. I do a lot of co-writing in Nashville. And the songs that I still love from my Nashville era are the ones I wrote by myself. Now maybe I'm just an egomaniac, which certainly is part of what we do. Sure. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have blinders on as a writer and you're constantly taking the slings and arrows and barbs from other people, you'll never finish a song, and it'll never become something. You have to stand for it and say, no, this is the way it goes, and this says exactly what I mean. And if you don't like it, I understand, and I don't mind, but I'm not changing it for you. That's the gem of songwriter advice I was fishing for. I'd rather for go down in flames than go up in smoke. You know? <laughs> Glad I heard that. That's the gem I was asking about the advice. Because that would actually bother me too. Of you know, like you put your heart and soul into a song, yeah. and then all of a sudden somebody looks at it and thinks, "Oh no, let's change this, let's change that." And wait, that's yeah, that's not my idea. You know, like now that's your idea. Yeah. I think one of the few exceptions to that line in the sand is my wife Mimi and quite often when I've finished a song and she doesn't really like I don't hardly ever play her my song she hears me writing them so she knows what's going on but when I finally play it for her quite often she'll say I think this word's wrong this word's wrong and dang on if she isn't right <laughs> <laughs> but I don't give that any other people that option yeah you know but when I am told the truth, I recognize it. I mean, I'm not oblivious to the fact that I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not that, that way. Interesting. You got any questions, John, for Catesby? I can't think of any right now. I'm just enjoying the conversation. It is very much. <laughs> it's, it's been fun. I, uh, I, I started out writing. I'll finish this up real quick. I started out writing in Lexington, Kentucky when I got out of college. I went to a little school called Transylvania, and a girl broke my heart. And uh, I'd been playing the guitar since I was about 14, you know, just humming and strumming and blah, blah, blah. And finally, I started writing lyrics, and they were sad lyrics about this breakup. And uh, eventually, I got over that, and I met another woman, and we, we got married and moved to Boston and got on uh, New York College Coffee House circuit, played all over the East Coast and the Midwest uh, colleges. And that really, that really cemented my self-image as a songwriter because I had to play, you know, six nights a week, original songs, and you really learn your craft and you get better at it. And then that marriage failed, and I moved back to Cleveland, Ohio, where my parents were living, where I had basically grown up, and just started playing in folk clubs. And then I moved down to the Virgin Islands and started playing in hotels and in bars, uh, and I always played my own songs. And all the other people were making 150 bucks a night, and I was making 75 because not as many people came to see me play. But I didn't want to be a cover artist. When people clapped when I sang a Paul Simon song, it was hollow in me. It didn't mean anything. Wow. When they clapped when I wrote my own song, it was like, oh, right, I like that. That, that feels good. And so after the Virgin Islands, I moved to, the, to Texas, and I played in a country western band after the oil field went bust and learned all those country songs. And I won the Kerrville Folk Music Songwriter Contest. And I moved to Austin and hung out with, their, with those people for a while and went on tour with a woman named Crow Johnson all over through the western states. And then uh, I ended up in Memphis, Tennessee area, and I met my wife. We got married, and she wanted to get a master's at Vanderbilt university and deliver babies at the hospital and i realized at that point i wasn't going to be a star so we moved to nashville and i got a job as a songwriter and she got the job at the hospital 
And then you know the rest. After, after all that debacle, we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, and that's when I hurt my hand. And I thought I was going to quit, and I just couldn't play anything but D and G. And You're such a I great could, guitar I could, player. I could yeah, barely seriously. play D and G, and then I came up with this idea for a capo, and I kind of rigged this capo that let me play with the bass string so I could get an E bass and a D bass and by pushing the lever. And it gave me a chance to kind of hang my songs on suggestions of chords instead of the actual chord. And I... I just got tired of feeling sorry for myself. My children were in late elementary school, and I just said, Casey, you can't let this example of failure be what defines you and the way your children see you. A song is just a melody and words. You don't even have to play the guitar to write songs. Get back on the horse. I got back on the horse, and I wrote every morning at 5 o'clock, before I had to go to work, I worked construction. And every night when I get back home, and I started making CDs. And I started producing them and getting people to play with me. And I started playing locally. And I became kind of, you know, a fixture in Wilmington. And then that worked great. And then my daughter fell in love with a fella out here in Nevada. And she moved out here. And she called and said, I'm going to have a baby. It just so happened that my wife and I were retiring. So that's what brought you out here. So we said, well, let's go raise that baby with a lot. We win for that one. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> so those are, that's a thumbnail sketch of some of the places I've played. But um, it's been great. I've met some great people. And this, the guitar has been my best friend. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't have a big head about it. I just have a real appreciation and a, and a respect for the the gift that flows through me i hope it continues to come i sometimes think i've written my last song and then next thing you know there is another one but um i try not to have a big head about it and i try to always respect my fellow writers and encourage them and see the good in what they're doing i don't think of songs as better or worse. I just think we're all kind of in the stew together. You know? That's how, you know, and I have nowhere near the background you do, but that's that's a lot of what's somehow curated here at A to Z. It is. is, is just has that all-encompassing blanket of it is. we're just here to appreciate each other's art, and yeah. there is really no competitive spirit. And there isn't. That's that's the th reason I was comparing this to the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville. Is there is a little bit of a competitive spirit in Nashville, but at the Bluebird, it's mostly a pat on the back, at a boy attitude. Mm. You know, that's great. You're doing good. And uh, here, here at Ada's Inn over the years, because we've been doing open mic forever, and last night's show was phenomenal. And a player like Catesby, or we have some very, very good Tony Ellis musicians. was fantastic too. Oh my gosh. Both of you, both of you were amazing last night. Tony was, he was something else, and he really puts his heart and soul in those songs. I think the one thing that I enjoyed, you know, like, because I get the benefit of mixing you guys, yeah. right? <laughs> so uh, Mike has been very, very kind with me about my, my headphone mix that we have going out to the stream, and apparently lately it's just been sounding, you know, like CD quality and stuff like That's that. That's great. So when I have two artists on the stage, like you two, like, so clean. it's... Oh, it man. was so clean. Everything sounded good, and I don't know. It's just yeah, it's, it's, it was a big is, pleasure to work with you two. I, he better watch out. I, I might put that in my trunk when he's not looking. <laughs> but yeah, that was fun. But this is a. <laughs> I put that in my trunk when he's not looking. <laughs> one this is a neat club. There's not much in compared to that hundred and eighty dollar uh, Alvarez you got in your hand. I yet. hope we can. <laughs> I hope we can start pulling more people in here. You know, it'd be nice to share this gift with more people. Uh, I, I, I agree. Um, part of what I was bringing up, though, is, you know, we watched your and Tony's show last night. And this performance level and the background and everything we're talking about right now. We did open mic the Friday before, or that Friday, same Friday. There's a young man named Tobias come in. Oh, man. And he's sharing his poetry for the first time in public. Man. shaking in his shoes just and the room gave him a standing ovation i mean that that 
that boy just cut his chest open and poured his heart <laughs> out on the floor and said, this is what I went through, but I survived. It was breathtaking. Yeah. An open mic. not for God, there go I, you know? Those are the things that keep me ticking for open mic, though, here. Is, I mean, That's we surprising. get people come in and, and just rip a guitar, voice like an angel. These first timers come in and just lay it on the line. Yep. Terrified mm -hmm. of doing it. And then I watch the room just come under them, support them. And I'm, you know, Tobias on Friday, I was in tears. Absolutely in tears. Well, that confidence boost that he got, you know, like I think with him working with us earlier in the week mm -hmm. and we recorded him just by himself on the stage, right. you know, recording his poetry and stuff like that. And you saw he was starting to get a little more comfortable with us. Mm -hmm. And so after that, you know, he came in yesterday, last night with friends yeah. and biggest smile on his face the entire night. I know. That's the one thing that it's I noticed. That up. was even before he got on stage. It's lit up. And so he gets on stage, does his thing, and then almost everybody was standing, applauding him, talked to him on his way out and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, that's that's something special, you know, and that's something that you can't really get anywhere anywhere else. You know, you it's literally somebody walking off the street, going onto a stage and right. laying it all on the line. Hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it was powerful. It's amazing the human condition that somehow we still can rise above all the things that are trying to crush us and defeat us. You know, we don't give up and we keep going. I mean, because the stories he was telling, you know, he, he could have very easily given up. Mm -hmm. you know? Many people do. Yeah. Overdosed, shot himself, whatever. But he didn't. And he, he rose above it and now he's giving that example to people who may very well be in his same shoes. And, and, and I guess that's what songwriters try to do. Yeah. You know, I, I was often accused by one of my publishers of writing too personal a song that nobody else could relate to it. And I'm going, what do you mean? This is a very common emotion. I'm just putting words to something that somebody else could very easily feel. And you just gotta be a little more trusting this is not just about me. I'm just a template for a common feeling that we all have. Look at it that way instead of it being too personal. You can't get too personal. Well, I guess you could, but I guess that's the difference between pop music or some of the popular country music is, you know, you have cotton candy music, which is basically the equivalent of, how are you doing today? I'm fine. You know, it just, there's no... <laughs> There's no depth to it. Or you have songs like you can write that are digging down deep in, in to what is actually the human experience. Yeah. 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 Mm. It's, it's great. HB, thank you so much. Thank you for very much, Mike. Coming thank and you, John. Spending some time with us Appreciate here on a Saturday it. Oh, morning. Thank you. Look forward to Good. more and more. Um, well, great. Well, we'll have to come in here and record a song for your album schedule with mr john over there and we'll we'll do it it's coming out quick if you guys haven't heard about that we are coming out shortly with a friends of the zen Den compilation album you'll start hearing more and more about that coming real real soon things are kind of taking off faster than john can I, john and i can keep up with them but we'll oh, really we're keeping up about it so all right all right thank y'all have a thank great day thank you thank you um are you gonna have are they gonna be produced